Good morning. I'm Shannon MacArthur, and I'm thrilled and honored to be here today at Hubcast Studios in Surrey, British Columbia, part of Peace Week 2023, under today's banner of One World. Perfect for talking about the one we are. One of my childhood dreams was being in conversation with wise elders, discussing deep and meaningful things. Today, that dream comes true. I'm a storyteller, inspired by the magical things that have happened to me. Child of a broken home with a brother two years older, I found refuge in books. While mom worked, her mom and dad took care of us. I remember my grandmother reading to us from the adventures of Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. Seeds are planted by stories. It's syntropy in action. Syntropy is the opposite or the complement to the power of entropy. That's the tendency for things to fall apart. Syntropy is the power that pulls things together. The evolution of life is an example of syntropy. First, there were bacteria who got lonely and overworked, and they got together and became plants who got tired of staying in one place. Animals roamed free until humans came along. Now, freedom is scarce and peace is rare. Stories helped me in the past. I propose that we create a story to engage the power of syntropy. What story can lift us like a lotus from the mud out of the reality we are living? Let us hold that question lightly in our collective awareness as I create a container for our gathering. A sphere of brilliant, scintillating, opalescent, golden light coalesces all around us. And I call my guardians and inspirations toward the approaches. For the East, I call Raven, representative of life, breath, communication, and new beginnings. For the North, I call bear, representing harvest time and abundance. Central to balance, bear symbolizes stability. For the West, I call whale, rider of waves of water and emotions. For the South, I call earthworm, one with many hearts, a spark of life who dives deep into the dark. For above, I call our great father the star that shines with perfect, unconditional light and love. And below, our great mother who holds us and gives us the matter that matters to us. For within, I call the moon's magic to guide and provide the light that helps us see our heart's truth. Into our midst, I call our ancestors, the ascended masters and the angels. I call the souls of all benevolent, benevolent beings seeking the greatest good for all that is. Help us weave wonders here today in the dimension of all that is that dissolves with our closing song. Thank you. And so it is. Each of my friends have equally powerful stories. Each will introduce themselves, and when the circle comes around again, we'll dive deeper into our stories. Our stories will build a foundation for a story we will imagine together 
that could hold the entirety of the one we are. In all our glorious diversity, the colors, the conflicts, the creations, the confusing issues of gender, sexuality, and individuality, as well as community, past and present, a syntropic story to guide our actions into the future that holds us all in grace and beauty. Please, Mayor, will you start us off, please? Mayor Cromwell. I would be honored. Thank you, Shannon, for having me. My name is Mayor Cromwell, and I now live in North Carolina in uh, the Southern Appalachian Mountains. I think I'm close to another one of the wonderful people here on our uh, in our circle. I'm originally from Maryland. Uh, my life shifted hugely, dramatically in uh, June of 2012, right after I was diagnosed with cancer. And I was asked to be part of a, to, to join an Algonquin medicine man in ceremony that Gaia, Mother Gaia had requested that we do. And it was just the two of us. And in that ceremony, uh, he said to me just prior to the ceremony starting that he was gonna be bringing mother's energy and consciousness into my energy body, but he didn't know how we were gonna disconnect afterwards. And right at the end of that ceremony, I heard mother start talking to me incredibly clearly. And the first thing she said was that if I surrendered to her, to the extent she would ask me to surrender, that she would help me heal from the cancer without the doctors. And that's what played out over the next um, 15, 16 months. And so I have surrendered to serve mother. And <clears throat> in this journey, I've had lots of adventures. Uh, I never know what mother's gonna ask me to do. Uh, she did initially ask me to do a book with her within the first two weeks of that ceremony. Um, that was the first book. And then she asked me to do another book. And uh, she's asked me to organize spiritual global grids of ceremonies around the planet. Um, she keeps me busy and I live by this credo that mother has a plan. And I, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this panel. I'm honored to be serving mother during these very interesting times. Thank you so much, Mayor. I'd look now to Tex Albert. Tex, would you tell us a bit about yourself? Wow. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, I'm very humbled for the privilege of uh, having been invited to be on uh, on this panel, the one we are, what are we, that you've put uh, together, Shannon. I say invited, but actually I don't think I, I saw an invitation. I thought I was seeing the announcement of a panel and I thought I would uh, attend. And before I knew it, like it was a fair accompli that I am a, I'm on the panel. Now, I'm originally from the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean, the Republic of Seychelles. Seychelles, there was no one, uh, let's say, uh, first people arrived in, 19, in, in 1776. So it's a melting pot of uh, people from all over the world. And uh, I do not consider myself an indigenous per se, but I do consider myself indigenous to the planet. And uh, I, I've come to realize I'm a cosmo-ecozoic. So I'm really a cosmic person in a way. Uh, landed in Seychelles through my mother, Maggie Burley, my father, Raymond Albert. And here I am uh, through, you know, how can I say, the complications of politics back in Seychelles made it that I left with my family uh, in 1988 for Quebec. Now, this is a very auspicious moment for me because uh, in 1981, 
end of 1981, I was at the time the head of the UN, North American and Caribbean Department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of Seychelles. And there had been a, a mercenary uh, landing. I won't say invasion because they didn't invade in the end. They, they landed, but they were repelled. And I, as the head of the UN Department from Seychelles, uh, came to the UN General Assembly in New York at the time when the resolutions were going to be voted on. On my way to uh, come to Montreal to the International Civil Aviation Organization Council to present a case that South Africa uh, start a process against the mercenaries who had hijacked the plane to go back to South Africa. Anyway, so in that sessions of the UN, UN General Assembly, I, on my own, not even the Sajid affair, but I was on my own and I voted on all the resolutions in that, in that session. And uh, I later came to realize that I actually voted on the UN resolution for the International Day of Peace, you know, which started in 1982, but the resolution was voted in 1981. So it's, I don't speak about it uh, publicly, but I think today to let you know how I feel to be part of this panel uh, on this occasion of Peace Week. So uh, uh, I'll stop here for the, for the time being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I am so glad that you are here. Sharon Joy Kleisch, please bring yourself in. Hello, love. Good day, good evening, good morning. I am Sharon Joy Kleitch, and my name tells you that my parents were so happy that I was coming to their family to make a family. So I'm Sharon Joy Kleitch, again, delighted to be part of this illustrious gathering of Stardust, because truly I am aware that I am of the same elements of the stars. And fortunately, I've been hearing that story for a while and now the James Webb Space Telescope shows us more. We hear more stories. So my background from my parents is Anglo-Saxon into the Appalachians, the Carolinas and Georgia, and they made their way to Oklahoma. So I'd like to acknowledge those peoples, the original nations who were there, Oklahoma City, where I was born, the Choctaw, Chickasha, Shawnee, and Cherokee. And I grew up as a little girl with alleys that I would explore and that I would find new adventures up the alley. And I had friend with a tree fort. So that's the beginning of where I've come from. As I grew a little older, I kept going to church and finding that religion got in the way of what I thought was sacred, life around me. When we moved to Dallas, the land of the Cato, the Wichita, the Comanche, there were no alleys. I couldn't believe it when I went to the back fence and there was no alley, no adventures. There were blocks and streets and neighbors. So I was frustrated and confused. And then I found things to read, like Shannon said, and among them were the Nancy Drew adventures. So here I am an elder, and I'm still putting clues in my pockets like Nancy Drew. I also like to put into the circle some of my friends who grew up with me in a Southern culture. And for some reason, we didn't stand back to let the boys shine and be the smarter ones. And then I also discovered that there was a story that I was living in Dallas that didn't make sense to me with their privilege our friendships, our parents who showered us with such love and affection with some of the other stories that came to me. And that was troubling to me. And then to end my introduction, I'd just like to say that what I discovered were the, the Florida Flatirons and Boulder Creek. And I felt that was the place for me to do more discoveries. No, not alleys, but mountains and lots of plains, a sea of grass that went on and on of gray and brown. So that's me this morning, Sharon Joy Kleitch, with gratitude to be part of our unfolding story of who we are today. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Sharon Joy. Thank you so much. And now, Gail Thomas, bring yourself in. Thank you, Shannon. My Stalagi ancestral name is Galigi Akawaskwe, dancing heron. Call me Gail. I am living in the river basin, Wayumi Ganaita, a long man whose head is on our sacred mountain and his feet are in the sea. And our sacred mountain is Adagu, which means helping many people. And we are the people who resisted both the removal on the Trail of Tears and the reservation that the federal government calls Cherokee. We resisted by hiding in these mountains. The federal troops came in and killed all the animals, trying to starve my ancestors out, but the plants kept us alive and continue to do so. We have a prophecy that when the animals come back, our ways will come back to our homeland. And they have counted 8,000 bears in the city of Asheville, North Carolina. So it is time to share the teachings according to Grandmother Raven, who guided me in so many ways. And I want to encourage all of you to resist and be true to your own nature with the stories that I'm here to share today as we all come together in this beautiful way. I am grateful. Gali ilga. Wado pilami awashite. Thank you all so much for coming together in these ways. And thank you, Shannon, for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Gail. Such a diversity we are gathered here today. My next speaker is Suzanne Taylor. Suzanne, please introduce yourself. Um, well, I'm Suzanne Taylor from Los Angeles. And you know, Shen, Sharon, uh, I also was very hooked on the Nancy Drew books and I have not, not thought of that since childhood but when you mentioned that i thought i wonder what you know she solved all the mysteries she always got it right she was so clever <laughs> i wonder of us people of a certain age i don't know if they read those anymore but um maybe you know that's kind of like what we're all about maybe maybe a lot of us will discover that we were nancy drew fans uh at any rate in my childhood um my father um just in this kind of joking way, uh, I would come home from school with a 98 and he would always say, where's the other two points? And, you know, I just grew up thinking I was supposed to get a hundred. I just was supposed to get a hundred and I've just grown up that way. Well, look at the world. I'm supposed to get a hundred. Now what? This world is a mess. So, oh my God, am I supposed to fix it all? <laughs> now that may sound ridiculous. But you know what? It's not ridiculous to me. Um, I actually have ideas for what we could do that are different from any I can find. I'm looking for a core group. I have a couple of people already who are much more powerful than I am. I need the core group to have either more power than I am or be really smart and clever and just like me, who am I? You know, you don't know me. I'm not any celebrity. But I do have a body of thought that I think could fix the world. And it's, it's, it's simple, really. It's all about what we, the people, can do. People say, oh, oh, just vote Democrat. No, no, the, the, the political system, you know, they're all serving their funders and not their constituents. So, no, we, we got to get some power from some other place. I have a whole body of idea about how we, the people, could um, really be effective. We have to get organized. We have to unite ourselves. We have to get a voice. We have no voice. We're all gadflies. But I have a whole dossier of thoughts about that. And I'm just out there trying to, you know, uh, uh, get attention and engagement 
So here I am on my mission, <laughs> hopefully uh, going to be successful. Because if I'm successful, the world gets 100 and we're, everything's <laughs> good. <laughs> well, you get 100 from me, Sue. Thank you so much for being here and a part of my panel. Now, we've had a little bit of a glitch. Uh, the other gentleman that I had on my panel uh, doesn't seem to have been uh, joined in appropriately, properly. Um, and so I, I get the opportunity. Um, instead of Ilarian McKirlia uh, from Alaska, we have Danalea Castell who has agreed to join us. Danalea, please bring, come bring yourself in. Thank you, thank you, Shannon. Hmm. Blessings and greetings, everyone. I come to you from uh, a new location. I'm here at the Hubcast Studios, and I first of all would like to acknowledge the long-standing and beautiful loving relationship between the traditional peoples um, of this territory and the land. And I'm speaking, of course, of the Katsi, the Semiamu, the Kwantlen, and other Coast Salish peoples. So thank you to the ancestors um, who have stewarded and cared for this beautiful land. I also need and, and, and lovingly wish to acknowledge that I am surrounded by the most incredible tree elders, um, tall, standing, vibrant green ones who have been speaking to all of us uh, since we've been here and also holding us in such a loving, happy embrace. And uh, um, I also wish to acknowledge behind me in the image is a massive grove of oak trees um, that are in a place called the Narrows in Nova Scotia, who I recently met. So you might um, imagine by now that um, my story is about my um, loving relationship with who I call nature elders. So these wise ones predominantly in the water, rock and tree nations and when I think about my, uh, to introduce me or an origin story, so one, I was a big Nancy Drew fan. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for bringing Nancy Drew forward. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would say is I used to have a dream when I was a child of uh, meeting a grandmother on the street who would recognize me and she would take me home and she would teach me how to be in this human world because I found it extremely difficult with my particular gifts for as an empath and a telepath, etc. But she never came. But it was the grandmother willow tree and the creek at the bottom of my street who called me. And they became my family. They became my teachers. They, together at that point, there were no words exchanged. I just felt home. And so my story is, is I probably very, very average in the sense that I would say that I started out quite in separation uh, from my human brothers and sisters and probably, and well, for sure, from my own humanity. And so my journey has been one of of um, being apprenticed and tutored by water, rock, and tree elders around the world, helping teach me about healthy relationship so that they could send me back into the human world to be a bridge and to bring this group experience that we call the listening field to the world at this time when more and more and more of us are waking up to our beautiful place with our nature elders and relatives, our place of co-creation. And to remember that we're designed for this and we're just remembering. And this new story we're gonna to create together is one that is filled with love and joy and hope. Thank you. Thank you, all of you have such wonderful stories. Each of you bring in an important element to what needs to be told here. Um, personally, I bring the element of uh, the, the diversity of the LGBTQ community. I, um, I spent 27 years living with a woman, and we had an amazing relationship. 
Uh, and I felt deeply loved in that family of uh, her and her mother and me. And uh, I, we also had a dog. And the dog was uh, prophesied to me when I was nine years old. I was told back then in a moment of, of angst and, and confusion that I would get my very own dog later in life. And there was no way I could make it happen any sooner. He would come and find me. And he did 40 years later. So I know that the things that I know are real and true. And the other thing that I was told was that going forward, there shall be peace. And I didn't know how it could happen. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, but here we are in Peace Week. And I got my very own dog. And I know that my peace isn't complete unless you share it too. And I know that on my knees in the darkness as a teenager in a moment of, of disconnect, I heard my mouth say, I will speak for you when the time is right. I will speak for you. I have come to realize that it is you that I speak to and for. And I ask you, what is our story? We are figuring that out together and there are no mistakes. There are only lessons as we go forward together with intention and attention because where attention flows energy goes this is how we figure it out and the lily pads will form in front of us as we step together forward on this path to peace and joy and beauty and abundance in this reality that mother earth has created as our playground and let us play together. And I invite you, Mare, tell us more about the story of you. Hmm. Well, first of all, I want to honor everyone who's part of this circle here. This is a really, really powerful, beautiful group of people. Uh, what I want to speak to is, uh, I guess you say the story of me, is, is where I sit right now in my <clears throat> worldview, in my uh, sense of what is happening. Uh, and <clears throat> I want to I speak a little bit to things that give me hope. Uh, I really see that a lot of what is happening on the planet on the surface is definitely chaotic within the human realms and yet there are so many people who are organizing so many people who are waking up and healing within themselves that there's this incredible mycelium network of hope uh, that is growing and growing and growing across the planet. And we are the mycelia. We are the ones who are finding each other and weaving our, our healing energies together, our actions. And I really see this as what is manifesting right now. And part of what gives me this vision of what's happening are a number of things. Um, one is how many people, and I really want to honor uh, Danalia, who's part of this panel, because your work is so 
in in the thick of this, you are really one of, at the forefront, I should say, of helping people wake up to the consciousness, the wisdom of the trees, the stones, the waters, the animals. Um, I love working with the nature spirits. I don't see them, but I hear them and I feel them. And my reality at this time is that so many people are waking up more and more and more to this amazingly loving field of consciousness that we are a part of, we were born into, and yet our Western culture shut us out of it with the dogma. But so many people are shedding that dogma. And uh, one of the expressions I learned was, you know, shedding the cultural conditioning. And so many are shedding the cultural conditioning. Uh, there are people who are teaching plant communication. Many, many people studying it. There are people who are teaching about animal communication and writing profoundly wise books of messages from the animal realms that uh, are, are teaching for us humans to wake up. And so many people are reading and listening and enhancing themselves by developing the skills to join in these communication fields. I mean, I have a very gifted friend who is actually communicating with the Northern Lights, and they have asked her to put a book out of their wisdom to the world and healing energies. It's just profound what is happening with the awakenings, and it's just rippling across the planet. And um, I also want to speak to Sasquatch because they have come to me a couple times and asked me to help them. Uh, they asked me to be a voice for them as I have been a voice for Mother Gaia. And I didn't take on that role because that was a bit out there for me, but I have agreed to support them in as many ways as I can by helping more and more people wake up to how intelligent and how evolved they are. So there's this, again, there's this web of awakening. There's this mycelia of activations. And, uh, you know, first and foremost in my life is Mother Gaia. Um, you know, she's yammering at me almost all the time. And uh, just to know that she exists and that she is a very powerful spiritual being, and she has a much greater plan along with all of her councils and teams that is a is really bringing this new earth in hugely uh and in the midst of the chaos that we as humans can get caught up in and you know if we just watch the news that's what we get sucked into but there's so much more happening here on earth that is incredibly beautiful and incredibly positive and i'm going to go out there a little bit on an edge maybe maybe not for whoever's listening um Part of what also gives me hope is I have an extraordinary friend who's a nature spirit mystic who sees them really clearly, communicates with them extremely clearly. And he has gotten all sorts of information about how many, many of the nature spirits who went into hiding thousands of years ago are re-emerging because the energies are getting higher on the planet. It's safer now for them to come out. They're being invited out to take their full role back on here within the very active dynamic multi-dimensional realms here on earth which surround us you know we are all part of this multi-dimensional dance um and this is even uh, more interesting perhaps to share for some is the unicorns who very much exist are actually giving birth again to young ones within the earth's multi-dimensional realms they held off from doing that for thousands of years. I mean, this is the kind of information that I'm tapping into that gives me great hope in the midst of <clears throat> the news and the trends that are really discouraging. And I do know that mother will always recover. You know, she has told me that countless times, you know, she is so ancient that uh, this is a phase that we're going through. And, and the biggest question is, is for us humans, but I, again, I sense that many, many, many humans are truly waking up to help us come around this corner, to help us make this transition. And I, I really want to speak also to the trends with regenerative agriculture, how many people are coming on board with that and funding coming forward for um, helping us learn, relearn how to grow our food 
in a way that is sustainable and restorative. And this is where it needs to overlap to our economic systems. And there are people working on that. We have the permaculture movement, which is huge around the planet. We have, uh, you know, this is a smaller movement, but the tiny home movement, recognizing the wisdom of consuming far less. Uh, I also want to uh, honor all of the people who are coming forward to offer healing uh, to the trauma levels, the layers within ourselves, and how significant it is that this is becoming more and more aware and the uh, opportunities to seek healing from the centuries of trauma, centuries and centuries that we have been ensconced in, you know, uh, suffering from. So I want to honor that huge trend and set of awarenesses. And I really want to speak to a particular group right now, and then I'll pass the feather on, is uh, the Heart Math Institute. I know that, I'm sorry that Alarian Mikulev is not here with us because Alarian and the elders that he works closely with speak to how we need to drop to our hearts. We need to live from our hearts. This is the path forward. And the Heart Math Institute is a tremendous organization that's been doing a lot of research and offering meditations and trainings for decades now to help more people drop to their hearts, to help more people live from that place of sacredness within themselves. So they're guided by their hearts. And this is what the elders are asking us to do. This is what the trees are asking us to do. Mother Gaia, the nature spirits, on and on. So I, I will end there and uh, pass the feather on and um, listen to the great wisdom of this circle here. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you so much. I know the work that you're doing is vital to what is going on in humanity. And um, I look forward to being able to offer more about the Thousand Goddesses Gathering that's coming up. Um, so we'll we'll get to Thank that, you. Uh, I, I hope. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'd like to pass the feather now to Tex Albert. Tex, come on in. Thank, thank you, Shannon. And Thank you, Mayor, who spoke previously. But uh, it came through to me uh, a few minutes ago that uh, this panel is really like a, an ensemble that has been put together by Shannon, an ensemble like uh, an orchestra. Shannon has heard each of us uh, at some point and uh, felt that uh, we can bring our our sounds, our music, and that together we may make a, a pleasing harmony, or at least an encouraging harmony, uh, harmony that will uh, kindle hope. Uh, we need hope in the world. There's so much uh, despair in the young people and um, you know the uh, those who are not so young who may have lack hope, who lack hope by not engaging effectively in 1967 on the 25th of march martin luther king said after a march in chicago he said those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. Those who love the planet must learn to organize as effectively as those who are just, uh, you know, drawing out of the planet for their personal enrichment or even drawing on the energies of fellow human beings just for their personal enrichment. So the task uh, uh, before us is uh, I would say it's immense, it, but it's, it's also crucial. And uh, I like the hope that uh, May said that uh, the planet will, you know, the planet uh, renews itself. So I believe so, to the extent that uh, we can, we human beings, 
effectively spiritual beings having a human experience. Uh, to the extent that we presence on this planet, in this life, with reverential humility. I say reverential humility. When we see ourselves on the earth, the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan uh, said, the pale blue dot in the vastness of the universe that's ever expanding, we told. And we're also told the universe is evolving since uh, 13.8 billion. I think 13.8 13 13 sounds a bit too exact. <laughs> I like to say 14 because I can't fathom that we can be exact about how long evolution has been going on. Anyway, so we human beings are in effect consciousness of the evolving universe. We see that we have the potential to destroy, much is being destroyed, and we can even destroy the whole planet with the arsenal of uh, nuclear weapons. But we also see, as it's been mentioned, that uh, we human beings can regenerate and restore, and uh, we can personally heal our own body has immense uh, potential of, of healing. It's only now more and more that uh, the potential of the subconscious is being, uh, you know, explored and, and tapped into. So there is hope that uh, were we to come together effectively in collaboration, in solidarity for the common good, effectively, Love in actions. You know, there's a lot of talk about love, we love, but it's really coming together in collaboration, in solidarity for the common good that we can, we can uh, do that. And uh, so we are uh, in the co-creative framework, which is the one world dot earth, uh, there is that potential for us citizens global citizens to come together wherever we are and uh, create new collaborations. Some even say some radical collaboration because it needs new thought. So the potential is there for us to do what's required of us at this time in uh, this uh, evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tex. <clears throat> it's wonderful to have you. As, as part of this panel, and I have really enjoyed your divine milieu as part of the 99 Days of Peace through Unity. Thank you so much for the gifts that you give. I'd like to in, invite Sharon Joy next. Come on in. Well, I, I feel that we're sitting in a circle of squares <laughs> around a campfire of energy. And I appreciate your voices, your energies, your stories. And something came to me this morning as we, as I was thinking about us, as we talk so much and hear stories of those who wandered across the earth. And it occurred to me, where are the stories, of the people who had the courage to step into the streams and the rivers? And what were they floating in and on? And what occurred to me is that um, maybe some of those are stories for us to listen to, and maybe others have heard of the Hopi Elder message about the river now running very fast. And I, that is one of the guiding stories for me and circles that I uh, inquire with. And it occurred to me that as we have evolved through these however many billions of years, or some call years. What about the rudders? When did we put a rudder on that river flowing very fast? And I think of that as maybe what I want to do. I already warned you that I was Nancy Drew in a way. And it occurred to me to just sort of put a pin in a few things of my stories that have caused me that I feel turned the rudder or maybe even a trim tab of my direction. So I'm going to just go through these very quickly or 
pretty quickly. One of them was I mentioned there were no alleys, but they were neighborhoods and streets. And at one neighborhood, there were a group, a small group of four or five kids that decided it would be fun as a game to burn me at the stake. And I think I was about four years old and people gathered together and we went to somebody's backyard to carry on with this game. And uh, the mother of this boy came out of her house and not in a stern voice, but pointed out that that probably wasn't a smart idea. So the thing that I felt was fascinating is that I wasn't afraid. And then I moved to another neighborhood and our next door neighbor decided, maybe not in quite such a playful way, that he would like to burn me at the stake. So he put ropes around me on his front porch and actually started to bring things to build a fire. And his mother opened the door and she stopped him. I know that sounds so bizarre, but fortunately, my mother was alive to confirm with some of my friends that that actually happened. I think the intriguing part is that for some reason, I was more curious than afraid. And another event as the Nancy Drew drops her, her clues or breadcrumbs is I remember sitting in my Sunday school class when one of our young men, we were 13, I guess, was talking about Mary Magdalene and the story of Mary Magdalene. And I heard this voice, this loving, compassionate voice saying, he doesn't know the real story. Okay, another clue to follow up with. So that led me into my fascination with Carl Jung and the collective unconsciousness that probably in Psychology 101 at the University of Colorado, where those flat irons are. And then it was a long, long time dancing along the worldview and the patterns that I'd come to accept and be comfortable in when I realized that money was really the power, the source of power. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I checked out where the money was and that was the banking, finance, and insurance. Well, to make a pretty amazing story short, I ended up running a business at Citibank for a few years. So I learned about money and I learned about the power of money and how evasive and uh, almost like the lure of the Lorelei takes us into paths that may crash us on the rocks. But during that time, I heard of this person who was described as to ecology what Jung was to psychology. Never heard of this person, Tehar Desjardins. So in my class to get a little balance back from my fun work at Citibank, I joined up to learn about Tehar. And the first night, this pastor, Daniel Martin, showed up to tell about when he and Governor uh, Cuomo, Cuomo had gone to the United Nations that day to tell them about the Earth Charter. So that was November 1991. So again, I'm thinking about where are the rudders? What is turning me? What are my choices? So the same time, I was also listening for balance to New Dimensions Radio, which I credit as my education. And Michael Toms interviewed the most amazing people. Certainly it was uh, Joseph Campbell. Uh, Campbell, I will credit as his first one, but I listened to David Bohm. I copied the recordings and listened over and over and over to him, to Rupert Sheldrake, Drake, to Fitchoff Capra till I could start to make some sense of what they were talking about. And then I discovered the Institute of Noetic Sciences founded by one of those men who walked on the moon and had such an amazing experience coming back to the planet. So that was Edgar Mitchell and then the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research who've also introduced me to Centropy. Thank you, Shannon. And HeartMath, thank you for that. And then more recently, listening deeply to the lands where I live now of Tokabaga, the Whedon Island culture, the land of the Miccosukee, the Seminole, who are teaching us more about the original nations and their stories. So I thank you for this involvement this morning and give you a few of the clues that I found along my way. Thank you.
Thank you, Sharon Joy. Oh, Teilhard and, and Jung. And I know somebody else who knows about Jung. Gail Thomas, can you bring yourself in again? Yes, thank you, Shannon. I'm so excited to hear her speak of Jung because I am a Jungian depth psychology specialist trained in classical Jungian ways. Mm -hmm. And those ways actually come from the grandmothers who raised me as a child from our medicine ways in the old traditions. Our family goes back to an archaeological dig on the north side of this oldest mountain on Turtle Island. And we have always stayed within 70 miles of the sea. We draw heavily from that. The Europeans didn't know to treat illness with anything but the body until they encountered us and they learned of illness beginning in the spirit and began to treat the spirit as well as the body. And in 1994, I was invited to Switzerland to cook for a retreat. And the owners of the retreat came to meet me and the elderly couple walked in and looked so surprised and they didn't even say hello. They, the, the man said, you are Salagi. And I had never had that experience. I traveled extensively in Europe and people guessed everywhere that I was from, but no one ever got close. But he recognized me and I could only nod. And then he really surprised me. He, he said, and you know the Psalms, which I did. And he took a book off of the shelf there in the retreat center about our prophecies. And he gave me that book, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. He turned to his wife, said something in Swiss German, turned back to me and said, my wife will come for you in the morning and take you to the cave where the teachings of the white race are held so you can sing the songs. All I could do was nod. I was mm -hmm. so surprised. She came the next morning. Unfortunately, she brought a woman close to my age who brought me some extra clothes to stay warm in those Swiss mountains. And we drove outside of Zurich for more than an hour, but no one spoke English. So we really couldn't talk about what was going on. But we went into the small town drove through the small town to what seemed to be the end, and it opened up into a meadow. And I had no idea where I was, but she parked the car, and we walked around the corner, and it was just an open field at the base of a mountain, and then I saw a huge stone with a huge opening into a cave. And it, it was very inviting. So we all went in there, and I started to sing the songs. The elderly woman got emotional, and she was out of my sight, out of my line of sight. I'm not sure what, what she did. The Swami from Sri Lanka, who was holding the retreat had, and had gotten curious and come with us, got a little spooked by the songs, and he left. And fortunately, the woman who was close to my age stood by me while I sang those four songs. And at some point, I realized she was on her knees. And when I finished the songs, she said, I see angels. And that's all the English we had <laughs> to work with. So I really don't know what was going on. But I want to share that prophecy and those teachings with you today so that you may have an opportunity to gather with people and bring these teachings of this prophecy into being that will bring our earth into balance. So let's start in the West, which is held by the water and the black race, the teachings of power through humility. Now we saw an example of this in Nelson Mandela and we continue to see examples in Black Lives Matter. And this is a beautiful teaching. I don't know if there are abuses 
of this teaching, I would be open to to hearing what others think of that who have direct experience. But let's move to the east, which is held by the earth, and the teachings of the plant medicine held by the Hopi red race people, because they have been here the longest. Now we see abuses of the plant medicine in the pharmaceutical you to go back to our ancestral natives where we allow the plants to grow in the wild where they choose to be and we allow them to bring their seeds into maturity before we gather them we let them dry naturally in sun and then we use the fire to release their spirit and we ask the spirit of the plant to help us to bring us help and health, we ask them spirit to spirit in this ancestral way. So let's move to the north, where the fire holds the teachings of the white race in Switzerland. And this is the teachings of the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear weapons. So we really need to come together and address the abuses of these teachings so that they may come back into balance. And we may continue as this wave of humans where we all reach back to share ancestors in this wave of humans 12,000, 13,000 years ago. We all came here to do this. And now let's move to the south, where the wind holds the teachings of the breath. And this is shared by the yellow race, the Tibetans. We see the example of the Dalai Lama. We see the abuses of the invasion of Tibet. And the pollution in the air. We come together and try to clear the air and come into mindfulness consciousness and awareness in these ways together. If we all share our teachings, we will come back into balance and we will continue as this wave of humans. So thank you for allowing me to share this with you and ask you to please join me in this coming to balance this Sunday, we're going to hold a closing ceremony and ask the fire to show us how we may come back into balance. So please join us then as well. Thank you so much for sharing in this way. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. Sue Taylor, what a background you have had. And I want to uh, throw a little light uh, on a portion of your background that people might not be aware of. And that is the crop circles. And the reason I want to go there is because I'm part of Humanity Rising and the after chat that is involved with that. And Jim Garrison, who is the president of the Ubiquity University, has been asked to go to Washington to uh, create the office that is collecting and disseminating the information about what is now known as UAPs um, out to the public and to provide them in such a way that it doesn't cause humanity to crash and burn in a very bad way. Um, and I honor him for his work. And Sue, the work that you have done needs to be acknowledged in this space. Please bring yourself in. Well, you know, I have this proclivity to get 100. So uh, part of that is what in the world can turn the world around? You know, what, what, what could happen in this dire state that we're in where we know we have to get from being selfish to being humanitarian or however you want to set up that, um, you know, polar opposites that uh, um, we have to get over this hump 
um, into our next phase of evolution. And I used to host a lot of events at my house. If you were in LA, you'd know my house. Uh, and you'd be very happy if you were on my mailing list. This is before COVID. Um, but the most successful program ever, uh, I had to actually go out for more programs and rent a hall, was about crop circles. And it just intrigued me. These were people who knew, you know, early on in the phenomenon, uh, who uh, actually one of the leading people in the early on phenomenon interest was from LA. And he uh, was my speaker. And, um, and, it, I was so intrigued by the idea that we could not explain where these things were coming from. And believe me, we can't. <laughs> uh, the, the, jar, the, the popular belief now, every time you read about crop circles now is, oh, that was that quaint thing that all those people made way back when, Doug and Dave and all those people. Well, no, <laughs> uh, it's still a mystery. And um, so I've made a couple of movies about it. One of them, the one that was my movie that I'm a filmmaker on, actually got a good review in the New York Times. Uh, you know, I'm going to put in the chat after this uh, today, just very day today, I um, I write on Substack. Um, and I'm writing, um, I'm past the crop circles now. That's not my focus now, because I think that the real phenomenon has left. Um, the, the There was so much contention as human beings get contentious. Uh, instead of accepting the fact that some miraculous thing was going on and letting it affect us as humanity, um, because if we knew there was another intelligence on the planet, that would be the most effective thing that would change us. It's like, oh my God, we're not the only ones, you know, we're humble us and we, we, we can use that. Um, so um, uh, I, I, I ended up saying, well, how do you tell the world about something? You make movies. And so I hired a filmmaker the first for the first movie, and then I became the filmmaker for the second one. And just today, on my Substack, I've sent out a mailing, and I'll put the um, um, the URL in the chat, where you can see this movie free. I, I opened up my movie for my mailing list. I said, please don't pass this on. I don't want it on uh, YouTube free, you know, because it's actually for sale here in the commercial world. Um, but after this, I will put the URL in the um, uh, you know in in the chat. But that's not my thing then right now. My thing right now is, well, what else could turn the world around? What could happen that could really make something really happen? And I'm thinking, listening to all you, it builds on everything you've said. There's enough people now who are tuned in. Uh, the idea of we have to come together to make a force. If we're all individuals, snap, you know, yelling away at the world, which we are. Oh, how can we? How can this be happening? How can we be doing so stupid, so stupid thing? But we don't have any organ. Nobody's listening to something that speaks for us. So I think about that. Uh, indigenous wisdom, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's the elemental kind of sense of belonging to the universe where we're not on the earth using it we're of the earth taking care of it ideally and that's back to Teilhard and that beautiful lineage of Teilhard to Chardin to Thomas Berry to Brian Swim who's my main man now I told you I work with a couple few really special people he's one of them uh, and um, he has the creation story and the first thing we would if, if you said to me, what's the thing that could most effectively change everything, change our story. Our story now is capitalism and greed, and uh, that's our worldview. Well, it's not even scientific anymore. Science has brought us information about we're not on a dead rock using it. We're on a living universe evolving with it. We are the universe. I am 13.8 billion years old, and so are all of you. All that is in us, and we're on the edge of it, evolving it, evolving it, evolving it, till we get to this noosphere where we're not a using body, we're a thinking body, and we're thinking 
you know, fair thoughts and loving thoughts and what have you. Uh, so change our story, change the world. And what that's kind of the primary thing that is in my uh, dossier of, of, of what can be done. And I have ideas for how to do that. I have ideas for how to get us a voice. Um, you know, I wish I had the whole time here. I would give you my, my whole plan. Uh, but when you get my, um, when, when you get on my Substack and you watch my movie or you get on the mailing for my movie, you can get on my mailing list. And I would highly suggest that all of you, because all of you are pieces of what I'm doing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm the action step. I'm the, let's do it. Let's change it. Uh, you know, I, the older I get, the bolder I get. It's like, I want it in my lifetime. I know the kids are much wiser than we are, and they'll create a better world. But I don't want I don't want to wait. I wish I could wait. <laughs> but I want it now. I, I want to see the fruits of the wisdom that it, it's so our birthright. We're so idiotic not to be cooperating and caring for each other and creating a beautiful world. And so... Um, I'm on it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, thanks thanks for the space to talk. And I'd love a bigger space, actually. Somebody give me a big space. So I'll lay out my whole plan. Okay. So, so now I'm going to put my URL. Hopefully you're not going to get out of here before I find it. So thank you for the, well, the talk. Thank, thank you so much, Sue. And, and you and I need to talk about uh, perhaps uh, talking to Jim Garrison and getting you on Humanity Rise and giving you the space you need. Uh, because, you know, we do have to think outside the box that we have created, uh, we have sure. stuffed our globe in, into uh, the, the one we are is so much bigger than uh, we have imagined. And, and uh, the, on the other hand, when you, you look at um, explosive materials, the the, uh, the 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 stronger the walls, the larger the explosion. And so uh, I, I think uh, the walls have been sufficiently hard uh, and uh, we're, we're figuring out how to um, uh, what we will form uh, as the uh, the what explodes from the uh, the walls that we have been confined in. Uh, and and now, uh, Danalea, your turn. Come on in. Wow. Hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm. I feel myself filling up. It's like the trunk of my tree is filling up with more and more um, nutrients and and. Uh, uh, Things that seeds, seeds that are going to to sprout in their own way through me. I'd love to pick up on um, what was just shared. I love that beautiful um, phrase, uh, "change our story." I think the most efficient way that I could share with you my worldview. Um, I'd actually probably say it's our worldview. Um, there's so many nature elders that. I'm connected with inside and outside that we 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 really are we, um, and uh, I've become more like them. Um, I did ask the nature elders recently when we were in Nova Scotia. I did ask the question, you know, are you changed when we come forward in co-creative partnership? Let me see if I can find the answer. Um, while um, Danalia, yeah, while when, you're uh, doing that. I just want to let you know and everybody know that I see Alarian has joined us. And so I, I will, after you're finished, Analia, I will bring him in. Thank you so much. I sorry to interrupt. No, that's perfect. I'm so excited. Okay. Um, basically, they said, yes, absolutely. We are all greater when we come forward to co-create together. Um, but they said, if you don't come forward with whatever your contribution is, because we live in a quantum reality with multiple pathways that are available, that particular pathway that you would influence, the individual, um, just is not realized. And the life force moves on in another one. So that made uh, a, a lot of sense to me. So I want to just invite us to close our eyes and imagine. I'd like to go back to 
most probably efficient way, uh, the worldview that that we see, of course, influenced by what I see, and I am a human. So the world I imagine, and this is what lives inside of me all of the time, I imagine this. So imagine that um, you or someone you know goes to a doctor's office, and they have something going on for them. And this is a world in which every human being is heart bonded with a body of water, a tree, a rock, a mountain, someone, everyone. And in this vision I've seen from the age of nine, pretty much, a child knows that it's time for them to find who their, their heart bond is. And this is a bond that endures until we, the humans, pass, pass on from this life. So imagine that someone's in the doctor's office and they're sharing what's going on for them. And one of the first thing the doctor says is, especially if it's a feeling pro issue or, or um, emotional or mental issue is, have you gone to speak with your tree or your water elder yet? No, the person says, I've been too busy. I haven't, I haven't made time. And the doctor says, hmm, my sense is that this is important for you. And so when he writes the prescription, he, one of the things on the script is a recommendation that the individual goes to consult and spends time with their nature elder. And then take this a little bit farther down and they take this note to work. <laughs> and they take it to HR and say, they explain what's been going on, whether it's stress or whatever it is their issue is. And the HR takes this um, instruction from the doctor and, and starts to look at that individual schedule and see what is actually possible for them to have time to go and, and be with their nature elder, to heal their heart, to, to come back into wholeness or balance, as Gail was speaking to. So I can also imagine, for example, a mayor and council, and there's a proposed land development been brought to, to the council. And the mayor turns and he says, this is in what, what area of, the, of the, the city or what area of our, our land? And who are the humans who are connected with those nature elders? Are they here today? Can they speak on behalf? Okay, well, before we make any decision whatsoever about this, let's, um, I would like to hear what the nature elders who are living in that landscape have to say about this proposal. And please be sure to ask them uh, what kind of a long-term effect that this, the development is gonna have on this area. So another, another thing that I could imagine is um, schools, for example. And children, you know, when it's show and tell times, you know, we often have objects, but it, at some point there would be a show and tell where the children would be standing at the front of the room or or even this classroom is happening outside um, and, and each child is sharing either if they haven't heart bonded yet, who they feel is calling them or if they have heart bonded, who it is and where they where they are in the landscape and a little bit about what they're discovering about that nature elder and about themselves. So this is truly a world in which our nature elders and relatives, they sit at the table, they have a place at the table. And I would say that, you know, the listening field, which you've heard me mention already, um, it's an experience that happens, it can happen online, which is where it emerged, but it also can happen on land. And essentially what we do is we make a place at the table by inviting them in to our meeting. And coming back to the, the heart math connection and the heart, um, it is through the love that we have for these nature elders and relatives, these trees who we already know and love. It is the love that binds us and it is the love is the channel through which we can communicate. And so this exchange that is possible is unique to each and every one of us. And it's the other piece that I really love about the listening field, how it's teaching us, is that there is no right way or one way to do things. There's only the way at that moment that is going to serve the greater good of all. And that's a constantly evolving uh, orientation or priority. 
And so coming from this place always of listening first allows us to step carefully in consideration of all of the wisdom and the knowledge that's available um, before, before we take action. And there was a river in uh, Nova Scotia, the Lahave River. And every time I connected with him, I saw this brilliant bright light. And I was like, dude, what is this light? When we, when we did the, the actual listening. And, and it was such a beautiful feeling. And as we continued to explore that, I realized that he was offering that as a tool that if I had an idea for moving forward, if I thought of him and the idea at the same time, if if I felt the light light up, then that was a green light to proceed. But if I didn't feel that, to pause and to continue to listen. So there's, there's many direct, beautiful messages that nature elders give, and I'm going to close just with one of them because I truly want to hear our, our brother um, Ilarion speak. Um, let, me, let me find... Oh. So there was one tree elder on the land called the Narrows and this beautiful, incredible hemlock tree elder, and his roots were literally wrapped around this giant rock elder. I mean, huge. And I was really curious. So when we do the, the solo listening time, um, I asked him, I said, tell me about your relationship with the rock elder you grow on. And I heard, saw, felt, our kinship goes back thousands of years, even before my time. And I said, but rock is so hard and immovable. You are soft and porous. How do you make the partnership work? And I heard, I adapt or die. So what I love about these beloved relatives is they're clear, <laughs> they're frank, they're honest, they are authentic, and they are always loving us in our wholeness. And so the new story for me is one in which our relationship with our natural world is inexplicably intertwined. And I close by honoring that our Indigenous relatives have been living this relationship for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so we are remembering as a species that this is our birthright. This is our design. And we are stepping into this loving, co-creative relationship individually and as a group. So thank you. Adapt or die. That is a powerful story. Powerful action. Our world is in chaos. Adapt or die. Maybe a bit louder. We can't hear Shannon. I'm sorry. We were not hearing you. Are you hearing me now? Now, yes, it's a bit better. Okay. So we move from adapt or die to a story that you haven't yet heard. Uh, past and present. Alarian Mercurlia, please bring yourself in. You have about 10 minutes or uh, longer if you like. We. Please enjoy your time with us. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, I'm sorry I'm on late because I had trouble with the internet and then trouble with the computer when I got it on and I had to, uh, <laughs> I couldn't hear anybody and they couldn't hear me. So we just <laughs> were working on that and finally got it. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, Shannon. Tell him, I'm not telling Kasuda, I'm one. Tell you, anyway, when I'm not with Doc Kuya, I said, uh, the morning tastes good, which is the way our people greet each other every day. And I said, I'm one, which means hello, my other self. <clears throat> this is another way we greet each other every day. 
And I said, I'm a Nungan. We don't use the word Aleut because that was given to us by our former oppressors. It's a Nungan, which means uh, the real people or the real human being by the sea. And uh, we have been out in the Bering Sea <clears throat> for over <clears throat> 10,000 years, and we're still there. Uh, and I said, my traditional name is Kuya. <clears throat> uh, Kuya uh, was given to me uh, uh, um, by the last Kuya that was left alive amongst my people. Uh, uh, and, and I was given that name at four years old. And it means like an arm extending out from the body, a carrier of ancient knowledge into modern times, a messenger. Uh, and uh, so I've lived the legacy of my name for a long, long time. Uh, so, um, uh, Shannon, do you want me to continue? I would love for you to continue. You have a side, as much time as you would like. Um, 15, 10 to 15 minutes would be lovely. I would love to hear you for even longer than that, but we would like to all have a conversation together. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, I am the um, chief spokesperson for the Wisdom Weavers of the World, which is a gathering of elders from around the world. And um, we met in Kauai for the first time in 2017 uh, to answer two questions. One, what is the state of the world as we see it now? And two, what must we be doing now? And we conducted ceremonies each morning by the different traditions that were there and uh, then talked during the day. And we filmed it. Uh, we've got lots of film, but we we uh, condensed the, the first uh, film to 15 minutes or 14 minutes. It was translated to 15 different languages and launched by Reuters uh, Worldwide News Service. Uh, and it was seen by over 80,000 people the first day. So it was a good launch. Uh, and we launched that uh, on Earth Day in 2020. And the message from the elders, the key message, is that um, uh, we must change our consciousness now. Uh, traditionally, the heart used to tell the mind what to do. Now the mind tells the heart what to do. And we reverse this law. The Yupik elders here in Alaska call this uh, uh, the reverse society or the inside out society because we reverse all the laws for living. And uh, the most salient reversal is this part of our consciousness that is now focused on the mind. And we think the mind is the seat of intelligence when traditionally the entire body and all of the things that are unseen within the body are the true intelligence. And in fact, my people, we um, uh, uh, understand that through the heart, through the existential heart, we are connected, it's the only place that is connected to the divine. And to be in the heart means to be present in the moment and in the heart. And we, we uh, have a definition of faith that is different than most people. Uh, it's not religion, it's spirituality. And this definition is that we trust implicitly, in, uh, trust in our bodies, trust in our lives, trust in Mother Earth, trust in uh, a relationship, trust in uh, ultimately a whole we call the maker. That all of this trust is embodied at the cellular level. And that we know through this kind of trust uh, that uh, everything else will be taken care of. We've been given everything that we need. And uh, we don't have a Santa Claus God, you know, where 
we pray to God and we we pray for ourselves and pray for others and say, you know, I pray that uh, I hope that uh, that uh, my my friend or my lover or my loved one will be healed from cancer or whatever else. We don't do that. Uh, we pray. When we pray, we give thanks and gratitude for what we receive. And the rest will be taken care of if we do it in that way. Uh, and so the elders are saying that uh, Mother Earth, she survived for billions of years. And she's going to survive for billions more. We're not going to be the ones that save Mother Earth. Um, uh, unless, <clears throat> uh, but it's going to be a question about whether or not humans are going to survive as a species. And it's going to be up to this generation now to determine <clears throat> what our fate is going to be. Everyone alive on this planet, on Mother Earth, is given a great gift. And that this gift you have is for the world right now. We are born here at this point in time for a specific purpose and to decide whether or not human beings will continue. Um, and so it's a great responsibility. And this gift that we have, each of us has, can be accessed only through that heart that existential heart and that it takes courage to go there because most people uh, have uh, separated from their heart because they have been traumatized intergenerationally and within the generation that they're in. They've been traumatized and that trauma caused us to separate from our heart to a point because we don't want to feel or remember the traumas that we experience. And this, uh, what we must do that the elders say is that we must take all of these things that are layering us to the point of numbness uh, and process, access them and process them and then let them go. And only in this way would we be able to reach the heart. And most people don't want to do that. Um, and so what we and the wisdom weavers are doing is passing these messages along uh, and uh, interacting with people like you. I'm glad you're here uh, to uh, answer any question. But ultimately, if anything that I say resonate with you, it's only because I am reminding you of what you already know. And so uh, that's uh, the essence of what I was going to say. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Elaria. Thank you so much. This is really rich. I, I, I and, and okay. With all of this richness, we get to now come together in a, a group so that we can see each other and talk together about what we have been presented with today and what is the one we are and what story has been woven for us today that will help us to figure out what is the story of sympathy that is inviting itself to be heard. From this group, today, in the now, and to start this off, I'm going to go back to Mayor and ask you, have you, have you got Mother Earth whispering in your ears or perhaps yammering? <laughs> And you're still very low, you know, it's hard to hear you. It's like we have Maybe to strain to hear you. Thank you. Does that help? You What's sound wrong? very far away. I've actually sent a message to Hubcast asking them to see if they can check 
your volume. Yeah, if you could speak up yourself. Yeah. He's here at the moment figuring it out. I've invited Mayor to talk to us about Mama Gaia. Perhaps Mama Gaia has a message for us. Uh, thank you, Shannon. You know, um, this is an exceptional situation to be in the presence of an elder uh, such as Ilarion. And I would like to actually defer to Alarian if he has any messages from Earth Mother, Mother Gaia, to share. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, yes, um, our elders are able to communicate and commune with Mother Earth. It's a two-way exchange. And uh, what we know uh, is what Mother Earth is saying now. Um, she is increasing her strength <clears throat> that she inherently had uh, to show us um, that we are near the edge. We see the fires, the floods, the political corruption, the uh, war. All of these different things that are happening, the gross violation of women, all of these things are due to one thing we feel. And that, of course, is separation from the heart. And that uh, to help us, Mother Earth is increasing her vibrational rate. Uh, and it's, it's what is doing, what her energy is doing is pushing into our bodies because we're inseparable from Mother Earth. And that energy is pushing out things within us that we have held back that we need to pay attention to. Uh, and uh, so that we can make it more visible. So everyone's going through something. Everyone on the on Mother Earth is going through something major. <clears throat> and what she is, I mean, what she's doing now is making the natural events come closer to human habitation. Uh, and so that we're having the earthquakes uh, and floods we're having in Libya, the, the, the Maui situation, uh, all the storms that are hitting the, the south in, in the US. And you know, all of these uh, events are connected and that um, uh, we have earthquakes, we have fires, floods, droughts, uh, storms, bigger and more intense than ever. But this is nothing compared to what may happen if we do not change our course. This, these events are going to intensify. Uh, there were three other worlds before this one. That is, that humans lived in large numbers in last the last three worlds. We're in the fourth world now. And we're transitioning into the fifth world. Uh, and whether or not we join in that continuation and evolution uh, that Mother Earth, she's increasing her consciousness too, just like we are. And so as she does that, we need to, to be with her. But to be with her means that we must understand as real human beings uh, what, uh, well, who we are. We must remember who we are. We have forgotten who we are in, in trashing of Mother Earth and, and all the things that are sacred. Um, and there's one other thing, my people uh, understand that uh, all the cultures in the world get um, their original instruction. You heard this term, original instruction. Well, we received those original instructions. Each, each group of people in the world received that original instructions, which were um, templated the same identical teachings around the world made different only by language, 
by vibration of the land and uh, that kind of thing that, uh, that uh, and, and so we, we understand that we re each received these original instructions, but we forgot them. And so what happened is that the elders around the world communicated with each other through the internet, not the internet, but the internet. We call it the language of one. And they knew that there was going to come a time when the original instructions are going to be um, misused. Uh, and, uh, and so what they did, they deliberated about what to do about this situation. And what they came up with was ingenious. Each part of the world would forget part of the original instruction. Uh, and, but no part would forget the same thing. And so each part of the world, the original instructions were taken apart like a puzzle. And, and so the only way that we could bring them back together again is if we open up our heart. People around the world opened up their heart. So uh, our elders have been going around the world for the last 20 years, sharing their way with others in the prayer that the hoop of the sacred teachings will be made whole again. And these sacred teachings are basically feminine or we have what, what is called feminine quality. Uh, and that uh, this is why it was going to be abused because all things feminine were going to be destroyed during this time of great imbalance. Uh, the, the women healers, the, the, the women shamans, uh, the uh, women healers, the Mother Earth-based cultures, and Mother Earth herself, all of these were feminine and that they were going to be destroyed. And that's what happened and, and still with us today. And that um, we have a chance, the elders are saying, we have a chance to stop this pendulum from swinging back and forth from masculine imbalance to feminine imbalance. Uh, and to stop this pendulum from swinging to dead center during our lifetime, it's going to be up to us. Uh, and that only in this way, I mean, I, when I talked with Don Alejandro, who was the keeper of the day calendar for the Mayan, he said, the people who are going to negotiate this time the best are going to be people of the fire, which means people of the heart. And that by doing, by opening up our hearts and not having any of the things that we carry as humans because of trauma and by of separation, we get together and share what each of us knows amongst our people uh, until this hoop of uh, original instruction, the sacred instructions. His original instructions are made whole again. So that's um, that's what Mother Earth is saying. And so Native people around the world, the spiritual elders, are sharing these messages. And in fact, you know, we uh, work with uh, Colombian elders. Uh, they have formed a national elders uh, group. And uh, there are over 400 uh, elders in this group with uh, about 115 tribes, uh, including the Kogi Mamo. Uh, and they have a vision which is shared by many groups around the world about what we must do now, uh, besides the most unselfish thing that we can do is to heal ourselves. But in the meantime, to help that out, we're, we're asking the people around the world, especially indigenous people, because they have traditions that go, that carry on the original instruction uh, to have ceremonies 
that synchronize with each other until a field of energy is created around the world as uh, something that is a field of love that people can tie into. That before, these used to happen, but it wasn't necessary because each group had their own area that they would, uh, had their ceremonies energetically would cover. Now, the thing is, these imbalances are so worldwide that we must do it worldwide and connect all of these groups that are doing these kind of ceremonies. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I honor you, uh, Ilarian, and Mayor, too, for uh, opening this space to, to hear Ilarian's wisdom. Uh, and I, I also want to honor life and the fractal nature of life. Uh, life seeks to uh, reproduce itself. Um, in in different fractal layers. And I wonder if there is more to the story than what Alarian and the elders and, and all of what we've been taught has, has brought to our minds at this time. Is there something that wants to be born through our hearts that is something that we have never considered before that holds all of our past and our present and our diversity, the wonderful, glorious, scintillating stories that we are, uh, as well as Mother Earth. What is the one we are? Does it contain the ETs? Does it contain... How does it contain all of what we have come to discover and imagine? Does it, does it contain our imaginations? What is it that we are? We've heard a lot of stories today. We've heard a lot of wisdom. This is inspiring. Who is going to talk first? Come and bubble up. Tex, come on in. Thank you, Shannon. Um, what are we? That's the question you put to us. And uh, the answer is actually in the hashtag, the one. We are the one. If we consider the overview of existence, you know, what uh, some of the astronauts have called the overview effect that they've experienced when they're out in space, it's not beyond our imagination to live that ourselves, to meditate on that, to see ourselves in this vastness of the universe on this pale blue dot, the Earth. If we consider, and uh, I think it's Sus Suzanne mentioned the 13.8 billion years of evolution that's still ongoing of our universe. Now that's called, uh, in some uh, milieu, the, the deep time perspective. If we take the perspective of deep time, where we come from, where life has come from, well, we know where it's at, we know where it can go. If we come together as one in collaboration, in solidarity for the common good, which is what Ilarion is saying, that uh, it's good to have practices like in local communities, but the problem now is planetary. So we need a planetary uh, consciousness. That's where the, uh, the noosphere of the planetary mind that Teilhard de Chardin 
envisage, envisage uh, back uh, you know, in the early 1950s, last century, like uh, this uh, global planetary mind is coming together. Like now we are communicating, communing from different parts of the, of the world. And uh, the uh, event is being broadcasted through Hubcast. Wonderful uh, endeavor that they have, Peter Young and Mark Caron, thank them. So we are the one. The consciousness, we all part of the consciousness of the evolving universe. And we can put the technologies to use, uh, the internet and uh, AI, we can use it for our good for personal flourishment, for ecological tribability. So we have the potential, we know now, we just need to collaborate effectively. And there's one platform that comes out of all this great endeavor of Unity Earth, uh, One World, Unity Earth, founded by Ben Bowler, and One World Platform, One World Earth. that's uh, the architect is, uh, uh, John Raymer. So I invite all of us, all those hearing us, viewing this afterwards, to see how we can collaborate and come together uh, through the oneworld.earth platform and, and uh, let's start new collaborations that we can have a truly culture of peace by 2030 on this planet and we can have uh, ecological tribability. Thank you. Oh, I like that. Thank you so much, Tex. Uh, and Sharon Joy has her hand up. Come on in, Sharon Joy. Thank you. I felt so called to follow what you set up for us because what I didn't mention earlier is where I felt a convergence. I mentioned the whole Hopi elder and his story of the river moving very fast. And I'm sensing our rivers, the voices, the power of our rivers all over this planet in some way are converging. And I'm so glad, uh, Suzanne, you earlier mentioned Brian Swim, Matthew Fox. And so in my convergence, I felt Matthew with his original blessing and, and Brian with the universe is a green dragon allowed me to step into the wonder and the awe again. And what I believe is it's so simple is we walk outside wherever we are. Look for the grass, look for the trees. If you can't find them, look up. Whatever color is above you is awesome. So what I believe is we're invited as the Hopi um, elder encourages is to look around in the river. There'll be those who stay to the edge and respect that. The rest of us, Find each other and celebrate. Maybe we need inner tubes sometimes. So th thank you for the elder wisdom to persevere, to come together, and to continue to guide the rudder for us on these rivers of our planet. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This is a wonderful river to share with you. Uh, Sharon Joy, the, the work that you're doing with uh, with Florida Networks and, and uh, you know, the how I first came became aware of you uh, was networking gardens. And uh, in my mind, uh, humanity is a, a, a fractal of a, an earthworm. We, where we have many hearts, and, and I do see us as a dragon rising from the ashes, like a phoenix uh, in, in, from the, the breast of our mother that has um, nurtured us and fed us for, for so long. And, and in my imagination where I play, uh, we are the green man I uh, created to restore her and and to to adore her we we um, help her tend herself with the hands of God that we are 
We have her ears. We have her eyes. We are her hands. Um, and I don't know what the, the pagans of the past actually thought about the green man, but I love that image of being uh, her tender uh, in, in her wild places and in our communities, in the hearts of, uh, of the, the, the child of gods that we are destined to be. This is my imagination. This is my story. And you are so welcome to play with me in that way or whatever way you choose. Uh, Suzanne, what do you think? Well, I wanted to make a suggestion for what actually could be done that really could be meaningful. Um, we're starting to come together. Uh, th there's so many organizations that are really after the same thing, making, you know, turning us into one humanity instead of all these separate creatures struggling with one another. And uh, so uh, all the different things are doing their thing. Well, we should all join together. Oh, it's so hard when you join together. Everybody's got their separate thing. And how are you ever going to agree? Whatever. Well, how that, you know, there's a really simple answer to that. Get some higher purpose that everyone could agree to and join together to um, uh, to get that purpose to be humanity's purpose. And to me, I, uh, I would suggest as the thing to build around and on would be this new story. Get the new story told to humanity. It's just an education process at some level. Uh, um, I, mean, I don't know, when I say the universe story and the new story, I know that Sharon, uh, you know, we're, we're deeply into that. I don't know whether you all resonate to uh, that Teilhard, to Thomas Berry, to Brian Swim, um, development of this story where we are one humanity. We are coming uh, uh, from the earth as one thing together, evolving together, as I said, instead of on a flat earth, using it uh, as fixed earth. Here it is. It's there for us. No, it's always changing. It's evolving. And we are the edge of its evolution uh, where we have the power to affect it. No other species can uh the you know, so wh why don't we get all the organ millions and millions of people that all these organizations represent that are all really doing the same thing, get us to actually unite. And as I say, the, the idea of unification is always sloppy. You know, how can we agree we're all different with these boards of directors? And no, no, get a higher purpose that no one would argue with. It, maybe there's a better one than telling the new story, spreading the new story, uh, teaching the new story. Uh, but to me, if the world were tuned into the new story, we would be a different humanity. And once we're a loving humanity, we create the world we want, rather than trying to make laws and impositions and fixing this and fixing that. While underneath it all, we're in this separation story uh, of not being united and not being together. So I don't know, to me, it's a very really relatively simple thing get them all together get all us and all the other organizations signatory to the same thing and get that to be what we teach all of humanity to get us all in the same story or some other thing that gets us all in the same container so that we're a force so that the government can't just ignore us uh if you have millions of, like taking to the streets but we have the internet we don't need the streets anymore. It's very dramatic. <laughs> but get the internet absolutely f on fire with this teaching, this new teaching, if it's a new story or whatever it is we've agreed to. So I, to me, that would be the thing to actually put into effect now to make radical change. Yeah, so, Thank you so much. What, what you're saying is absolutely true. This is what the Colombian elders' vision is, is to unite the indigenous people around the world uh, under sing, uh, a singular thing to conduct uh, their sacred ceremony during the significant moon time and sun time uh, simultaneously. And so they are doing their ceremonies and people as they get it are joining those ceremonies on their own. They're doing their own thing. And so uh, we are asked to to do what our hearts are telling us to do. Now, business as usual is not going to work. I mean, 
you know, doing the things that we're doing now, even the state-of-the-art thinking and the state-of-the-art technologies are not are nothing but the old regurgitated as the new. That it is something that is transrational. It's not rational, it's not logical, it's transrational, like the heart. And that we must go to our heart. The most unselfish thing the elders say that we can do right now is to uh, uh, heal ourselves so that uh, we can be open and clear to receive what we need to receive. And one must understand that uh, this faith that, that I'm talking about, this, this faith that is true faith, where you in, in, uh, engender your faith at the cellular level is where we need to go. And we need to help people uh, and guide them into how to get there. Uh, and so uh, uniting or unifying rather uh, all the groups around the world that have similar visions and similar uh, desires uh, is a way to go, and uh, that each group must do their own thing, but it must be in concert with the others in what we're trying to uh, help human beings do. Now, Mother Earth, uh, you know, when the pandemic first hit, you remember when all the cars stopped running around and all, you know, uh, we stopped, we slowed down, we stopped. And what Mother Earth was doing, she showed how fast she can heal herself when that happened, because the animals were showing up where human beings were used to go before. Uh, the ozone layer above the Arctic healed. Uh, the, you know, there were so many things that Mother Earth was showing that she can do in very quick time if we... Uh, find our place, our, our place in, in all creation. And when we do that, this, this meaning of one will take a different uh, level of meaning because we, you know, we truly are one, but to say it doesn't mean anything unless you get there, unless you feel it, and you cannot understand it. It's like trying to understand well, like if you were a two-dimensional creature, you were trying to understand the third dimension, you can't uh, because you've never experienced it. So until you experience being a real human being, you are not going to know what to do. And we are figuring it out together. Thank you so much, Hilarion. I'm so glad you made it in and, and we're able to join this conversation. We're now moving into the last few minutes of the presentation, and I'm uh, grateful to be able to uh, ask Danalia to come and speak to us, after which I'm going to ask Gail Thomas to uh, come in for the last few words and our final song. Thank you so much, Danalia. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who has spoken. When you pose the question, what is the one that we are, or who is, what is, um, I reached out to the nature elders who are surrounding me here and asked if they had something to share. And as one, they, they felt me, and I felt them. There was this exchange of this beautiful energy. And then there was this melody that I kept singing.
the word that vibrated for me when we were talking about the new story was discover, discover the new story. Live the question, live the question. And coming back to Ilarion, thank you. Um, this part about healing ourselves, I myself have not been offering anything this year because Spirit has guided me. It's the healing of myself that needs to happen before I can step into my next level of service with the listening field. And it is my old stories, really. I see them now as stories and illusions, and I can choose now if when that story, when, the, when life presses against that part, Mother Earth presses against that part, and the story pops up in front of me, I now can see the difference between the story as an illusion, there's space now between the story and myself. And I get to choose in each moment if I follow down that habitual path or I go, oh, there it is, oh, pause. Breathe. What's my choice? I choose life. I choose life. When we ask the Lahave River in Nova Scotia, what's your vision of the new earth? And I heard him say, everyone serves life. Thank you. Everyone serves life. What a glorious story that will be as we write it together. I love that. I love what we have created here today. Uh, we have time. And I, that time I want to give to Gail. Gail, come on in and talk to us. Thank you, Shannon. I'm reminded of my grandmother Raven Hale's most urgent teaching to me. She's the author of the Cherokee Astrology book, and what she stressed throughout our time together was learn to listen to our ancestors. We don't need to know them because they know us, and the ones who have done their work will Bring those original instructions back to us. And so I've learned to listen with her help. And I receive songs in the dream time. And I would love to share the song with Shannon. This is a song that came to me on winter solstice 2018. When um, we initiated a dear effigy pipe that was given to me at least 25 years ago in the raw clay state because the great antelope with the Santa Clara Pueblo nation had made it and not uh, been able to fire it before he crossed over. So it came through me uh, to me through a sun dancer who said, I hope you can get this fired. And I carried it around for 25 years. And finally, a firekeeper came who was willing to fire it in his outdoor kiln. And the sun dancer was willing to initiate the pipe with me. We, we spent years determining, would it be a Salagi pipe? Would it be a Lakota pipe? Because I held Lakota ceremony, very traditional Inipikaga ceremony here on our sacred mountain for 13 years. We chose to bring it into Lakota tradition. And so the song came to me 24 hours after we fired that pipe in the Lakota language, and Shannon and I are going to put it together and give you the English translation that goes also with the Lakota language. First, we will hear it in its original form from Gail. And uh, Gail, thank you so much for listening so closely to your, uh, your inner voice. Uh, we each have an inner voice that invites us to listen for the guidance that help us uh, go forward together in a good way. And so uh, 
uh, the uh, original sound of um, the the song. Please, Gail, would you? Would you grab your drum now and, and share with us that uh, that song? Yes, I'm happy to, Shannon. Thank you so much. So much. to ancestors with a common people's pipe. of grandmothers we want to live. Drum of sacred elk nation, pipe of black-tailed deer. Sending our voice on this good day with a common people's pipe. Thank you so very much, Shannon. Thank and I invite you, you so much. Ceremony with the fire this Sunday on the in the gathering room, so that we may offer tobacco to set through the fire on this sacred mountain where we did the opening fire, and ask for balance together. Um, good work, everyone. Thank you so much for your service. We are in service of life together. Bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. For your vision. Oh, you are all so wonderful. I love you all. Thank you. We are the one we are together, all of us.
fasten your seatbelts because we have a lift off. We have a lift off. Unity, 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 earth. 
what binds all living things together as one family. It's the bottom line of our life, and it's the bottom line of the generosity of this Mother Earth as well. And for me, I feel like it's against the deepest law beyond any religion. It's the law of the Earth, but it's a violation of a very deep law for anybody to get in between the Mother Earth and what she would give her children to live. When I look at the world now, I see that it appears to be in chaos, but what's really happening in my understanding is that we are really trying to have an opportunity to break through to something greater. So I see that humanity is being forced to come together as one, as never before. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, and that that is our divine purpose. That is our mission. And we've all been called to be light beings, light bearers, so that everybody can see and feel my light, my love, and I will feel and see your light, your love. And together, we will create a new sustainable planet and a new vision for all of us filled with light and love. We're here on uh, the Holy Land Living Water program, celebrating World Interfaith Harmony Week as part of Uday 2020. Uday is a concept that's been building since 2012, uh, and it's really bringing together music and spirituality and interfaith dialogue, and really a lot of indigenous wisdom, uh, and bringing it all together in this moving experience through sacred sites. To come together to have an experience of unity, of what it looks like when we show up in our differences, and we honor that, and we, and we come together and have a shared experience in a sacred space, uh, and move around with prayers, and with music, and song, and spirituality and celebration and healing. And that's the U-Day concept. You see the land is so barren. God wanted us to be filled with life and then life to flourish. So it also fills me with pain to see that the way we have abused God's creation, at the same time also with a sense of resolve that we can 
together, heal once again our land. Uh, and go back to the, the commandment that we received, take care and cultivate my garden. Let's go back together, hand in hand, sing with creation, feel united with creation and with humanity, with everyone. As an Aboriginal person, this new experience that I've felt here at Mount Temptation, normally wherever I go, I feel Mother Earth and my country and Mother Earth coming through, through the earth, through the feet, through the soles of my feet, through my body and out to the universe. But coming here to Mount Temptation, a new experience for me has been the reverse of that. For the first time, the energy is coming from the universe and through my body down into Mother Earth. And what it says is this, friend, do it this way. Whatever you do in life, do the very best you can. If you get knocked down, get up. If you get knocked down a thousand times, get up a thousand times. And it says when one sits in the sacred hoop of the people, one must be responsible. Then it says, if you do it that way, whatever you ask for, that's exactly what it's gonna be. And from here, we proceed with that complete understanding. All the prayers have been answered. All we need to move forward is our faith and complete hope and trust that all the sacred prophecies are being fulfilled. My names are Shunkmano and Shinupasapa, and I stand responsible for the Creator for all my words and my actions. Today's time and day when we come together to pray, when we come together to stand with our fellow human being. Within our heart, when we are all connected, it becomes a circle of remembrance with purity of thoughts, honoring the pledge of the souls in front of the Almighty that we are one. And inshallah, in the coming time, we will be continuing to honor that pledge of oneness, not only by words, by action. And Unity Earth is the platform where these thoughts, noble thoughts, noble intention, turn into practical action. My friends, my friends. Oh, hey, my friends. <laughs>has been such an enriching experience in my life to feel closer I'm not the most religious person but I want to say to feel closer to God and um, I also came with personal questions and for me it was possible to ask these personal questions to a reverend to a Buddhist monk 
to a rabbi, uh, to an imam, and um, I learned so much from each one of them. It broadened my perspective immensely. Mother Earth doesn't understand us and them. The Mother Earth only understands we. From my perspective, we, we retold that story that has been looming over humanity that word Armageddon, we retold that story and said, we don't know what the end really is. And we actually have an active role right now in determining what will come next. It might be Armageddon, we can choose that, but is there another possibility? Or can it be the end of one thing and the beginning of another? <laughs> The importance of interfaith harmony and mutual respect is that only a universalism that comes out of our own different identities is really sustainable. What we need is people coming from their traditions, from their own identities, from their own commitments, but out of respect and love for one another. That kind of universalism that recognizes the divine in the other and seeks to be able to bring that to a greater awareness is precisely what will give our world the energy to be able to promote peace, tolerance, harmony, and a world that we can leave with a sense of confidence for our children and grandchildren. Tell me why there's so much fighting When we could all be uniting Tell me why there's so much greed When planet Earth can provide everybody's needs Tell me why there's so much division When we got so much in common To see a change you gotta be the change Shine your light, stand up for the right And let's unite as we all come together as a spiritual family Let's unite As we all come together on this caravan of unity Let's unite As we all come together as a spiritual family One love Let's unite As we all come together on this caravan of unity It's a caravan Mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan.
one caravan of unity. We on a mission, yes we on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We on a mission, yes we on a mission. Aboriginal people are universal. Our dreaming doesn't separate heaven from earth, as we are connected to the universe from the ground, our mother, to the trees, to the animals, to the sky, to the stars, to the sun and the moon.
unity, U-N-I-T-Y.